When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. I can't help but ponder how awkward was this meeting between Martha and Jesus. Martha comes outside the village and meets Jesus on the road. She knows that Jesus is aware that Lazarus died because word was sent many days ago. Jesus knows that Lazarus is dead because he waited a few more days before coming. Imagine, what is Martha thinking and feeling? What is Jesus thinking and feeling? A little over a year ago, my friend, my brother by choice, died after a fight with cancer. In his last weeks, my husband and I were apprised of his declining health. When he was moved from his home hospital bed to a hospice center, where a daily watch was kept by those who lived closer than three provinces away. Thank heavens for cell phones, social media. Electronically, we kept informed, we shared prayer posts, we texted our love, and we felt like we were present in spirit. We made plans so that we would be ready to travel when needed the time chosen for us because I was asked to preach at his funeral service. When our friend died, we set the plan in motion. We arrived in Ontario and we prepared to face his family, our chosen family. The visitation was in a cathedral. One walked up the side aisle, passed the casket in front, and then greeted the family before exiting down the other side aisle. Waiting in the reception line was awkward. One of my best friends had died. His wife, another best friend, and my chosen sister was waiting. Our goddaughter and her brother were waiting. Our adopted Finnish grandmother was waiting. What was I going to say when I reached them? How was I going to act? Was it okay that I hadn't been there for the death? How could I be supportive and grieve at the same time? Was I going to fall apart? Did I feel guilty for living so far away, for not making a point to visit more often? Had too much time passed? Had too much happened in the time since we last saw each other face to face, face to face, that our connection was no longer strong? Good gracious. Awkward. John's Gospel has Martha go out to meet Jesus. This meeting is told as a conversation that starts in a hard-hitting kind of way. It doesn't start with small talk about the weather or the local gossip that's happening in Bethany. Mary starts off accusingly. If you had been here, and with that spoken and out of the way, the conversation quickly turns to deeper thoughts, words to be seated as hope amidst grief. Martha affirms, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. Jesus and Martha, in the middle of the road, contemplate resurrection, life from death, both later and now. Satisfied with enough bread for the moment, Martha goes off to get married. Jesus remains outside the village where Martha had met him and waits for Mary to meet him there. Mary rushes out to Jesus. Her approach, she kneels at his feet and she weeps. As the reception line in the cathedral shortened, as I wondered if my, reflect, my reaction would be a Martha sort or a Mary sort, as I passed my friend's casket, the awkwardness of the moment evaporated quickly. In an instant, I ended up in an embrace with my sister, an embrace without words that didn't cease to end. In the silence and time standing still of that embrace, there were tears, acceptance, and love. Nothing had changed, but as we drew away from each other, squeezing each other's hand, we acknowledged that everything had changed. Jesus, Martha, and Mary are standing in the road outside of the village. Awkwardness evaporates. Nothing has changed. But as they pull away from each other,
together to move towards Lazarus's grave, Jesus weeps. Jesus is disturbed in spirit. Jesus is deeply moved. Walking together, they acknowledge that everything has changed. This is an experience to which many of us relate. Whether a spouse dies, our employment changes, we survive cancer. Whether we change gender, become divorced or married, whether we win the lottery or suffer addiction, a family member is imprisoned or we adopt a child. All of these circumstances and so many more change us. They change our relationships and affect our ability to interact with our church family. In these times, people often withdraw from familiar relationships. They stop coming to church because of the awkwardness of the moment. In the church community, it appears like nothing has changed. Everyone is going about their business as usual. But collective experience, because we are in relationship, tells us that everything has changed. Our current situation is like the story of Lazarus. Lazarus is raised from the dead. Nothing is the same. Everything is made new. All of his relationships are affected. Loss does that. Grief does that. Death does that. Church as we knew it, in a building and sitting in pews, died two weeks ago. From this death came new life. New expressions of church and virtual Christian community. Death forced a fervor of creation and innovation and potential possibilities. Churches that were occupied with dwindling finances and inward crises moved to look outward. Nothing as in faith, theology, scripture, worship, ministry, pastoral care, offering, has changed. But we acknowledge that everything has changed. We're living in a new life, and in an expectation of the fullness of Mary's affirmation. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. As virtual church community, this affirmation is at the heart of creativity and innovations, bringing the one coming into the world into not just our building, but actually into the world. A colleague shared with a group of pastors earlier this week that after a death, meaning any kind of loss that causes one to walk through the valley of grief, a valley of dry bones, it changes a person such that when life returns to what is considered normal, it is normal, but it is a change normal. This can lead to a certain sadness, an awkwardness, a reserved celebration that we have come out the other side, a reserved praise the Lord, all things are new. The first time one sits in a pew alone after a spouse dies, the first time in a long time when one can go to church and sit beside a family member newly arrived to Canada, the first conversation over coffee when it seems that too much time has passed to have anything to talk about. The first Sunday after being away for a month, when all the children have grown and are unrecognizable, when we forgot the names, and for this congregation will have new babies and new names to learn. There's a sadness and an awkwardness mixed with joy. During this time of physical distancing and experiencing the fallout of COVID-19, each of us has been put in a situation where we are daily confronting our relationship with death. We're living in a valley being scattered with dry bones. We face the possibility of physical death or serious illness. We face death, we face loss, whether in paychecks or lifestyle, in our pension funds, in freedom, in a sense of stability and connectedness and physical contact. We are all grieving. Parts of life as we know it are dying. And all of us are in the process of being dry bones with new life being breathed around us. When this is over, 
We can expect an awkwardness as we rise in a world where nothing is the same, where everything is made new. The Gospel in today's scriptures stress that the word of the Lord brings new life to that which was dead. Life comes out of death. I think about this in relation to our virtual worshiping community. For this community, we are experiencing a death of sorts, a loss, of eating together each week, of sharing the sacrament at the altar. In pastor world and in Zoom meetings between Lutheran bishops and theologians, many conversations have been had over the past two weeks about offering virtual communion, suggesting that if each person watching were to have a piece of bread and a little bit of wine, that the real presence through the words of institution could travel through the cyberspace into each and every home, communion could still happen. Our bishop has taken a different tact. Not that he disputes the ability of the real presence to expand beyond our limited understanding of space and time, but he suggests that we are in a time of a Eucharistic fast. How very Lent. I'm not sure that many of us who grew up in Canada, except for those who remember rationing during World War II, have been forced to fast. Human beings are consumptive by nature, and when we choose to fast, we give up something like chocolate or coffee or alcohol or smoking or fast a day before medical tests. This Lent has been forced on us. We've been forced into a fast. A fast from creature comforts, whether certain foods or toilet paper. A fast from movement, from going where we want, when we want, and doing what we want, when we want. A fast from physical contact and gathering. And now a fast from Eucharist. A fast from the fullness of God's grace that we experience through this sacrament. Nothing has changed, but everything has changed. Whenever Easter happens, that Sunday when we are once again side by side in sacred space, in the awkwardness of the moment, because we will all come changed, because in a variety of forms we have all faced death, walked through the valley of dry bones, we will arrive at the Eucharistic table together to partake, to eat, to digest. Life. Some of us will come like Martha, others Mary like. There will be accusing thoughts. Why did you let this happen, God? And there'll be deep conversations, and kneeling, and tears. Awkwardness will evaporate, and in the depths of our loss, through the valley of death and dry bones, we will awake and be filled by the experience of the fullness of God's grace in bread, in wine, and in community. Life. All will be new. We will be new. I can't wait to be resurrected to new life. Until then, I hold fast to Martha's affirmation. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. In your word is my hope. With you is steadfast love and plenteous redemption. Out of the depths my soul waits for the Lord.